Okay, great. Hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon, uh, except for folks, if anybody who's on the West Coast, I think that's still a morning for you. But for the rest of us here in the US, it's the afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Julie Bershatsky. I'm the Director of Community Living and Employment here at Institute on Community Integration at uh, University of Minnesota. My preferred pronouns are she and her. I am a white middle-aged woman with short black hair, black and gray, actually, wearing a black sweatshirt. I'm sitting in my office with a blue painting behind me. There's also a picture below it of some hedgehogs. I don't know if you can see the details, but... Uh, thank you for joining us for this edition of the ICI Policy Forum. We try to do these on a regular basis every once every once every couple of months or so. It's been a little longer since our last one. Our last one was in June, so we're catching up. Uh, the topic today is based on the latest edition of the Policy Research Brief, as usual. The title of the brief and the topic today is Most People with IDD Getting Long-Term Services and Supports Live with a Family Member. So it's people with IDD who live with a family member is the topic. Um, some housekeeping notes. The forum today, as always, is being recorded and will be posted on our, on our site along with the slides for the forum. Uh, we will give a link to where they will be posted at the end of the forum. You'll get an email. Today's discussants are my colleagues, Sherry Larson, Linda Lottie Anderson, and Neville Ginjang from ICI as well as Shelly Reynolds from UMKC, and you may know her uh, from her work on charting the life course. I will ask them to introduce themselves shortly. Also assisting is our colleague, Nick Fernholz, who will be assisting with the logistics. So if you have questions about Zoom specifically, um, you can chat him. He, he's called Policy Forum, but it's Nick. Um, as of with all of our policy formal forums, this is an informal discussion, so feel free to chime in at any time, either via chat or voice. Feel free to ask your questions. We'll also have audience discussion questions at the end. Um, a reminder, I'm sure I, and not, not a necessary one, but nevertheless, to please be respectful of others' opinions. Um, I think that's it for the housekeeping notes. Um, let us get started. I'm going to ask our discussants to introduce themselves, and then I'll briefly talk about the research issue and the data before we launch into the discussion. So Sherry, Sherry Larson, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. Afternoon. This is Sherry Larson. I'm uh, the director of the Residential Information Systems Project at the University of Minnesota. I am a blonde eye, blue hair, blue eye, blonde hair, middle-aged woman with a, with a, um, a magenta or a, a, a maroon colored top. And Linda, you're on mute, Linda. Always, uh, I'm Linda Lottie Anderson. I'm a researcher at the Institute on Community Integration. Um, I have blonde hair, but it's pulled up, so you can't really see it. Uh, and I'm wearing a flowery top, and the background is blurred. So, Neville, would you like to go next and introduce yourself? Oh yeah. So my name is Neville Genjang. Um, uh, a land fellow um, of last year, 2021-2022. I'm also a final year pharmacy student at the University of Minnesota. So um, I just finished my land uh, uh, program, and this was part of my land project. And uh, I'm a black male in my late 40s. I'm bald. As you can see, I'm putting on glasses. I'm putting on a blue shirt with white spots. And, and I am in my home office, though the background is blurry. Thank you. Thanks, Neville. I see you're the only one who has given your age so far. That's that's notable. Um, last and la not least, Shelly. Thanks, Julie. So um, I'm Shelly Reynolds with the University of Missouri, Kansas City Institute for Human Development, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a white middle-aged woman with blondish brown hair with brown eyes and a peach jacket. I'm in my office um, with a whiteboard behind me and a whole bunch of um, frames on the wall. So welcome. Thank you. All right. And thank you to the four of you for being here. 
As I said, today's policy forum is about people with IDD living with family members. Um, the topic is based on the last issue of the policy research brief, which you will see on the slide. Uh, obviously, you, you're, not, you're not expected to see the details. This is just a snapshot of the front page and the back page of the, of the brief itself, so you see what it looks like. This is the stuff that we'll be talking through today. If you want to look at the brief itself, you can find it on our website. And again, we'll give we'll give a link to that um, at the end of the forum. We'll put it in chat as well later. Uh, let's see, where am I? All right. So, what are we talking about today? Our research issue is that people who uh, most people with IDD who have intellectual development disability live with uh, family members. Obviously, family members uh, for these members with IDD are vital in their lives. They provide support. They uh, are important for everyday tasks and everyday living and community involvement. Um, it is important that public policies and long-term services and supports honor the critical roles that families play. We will note, and we will talk about this a little bit, that the, the proportion of people with IDD and who receive services who live with their family members varies from state to state, and that varies by, uh, pretty widely. Um, what we will be talking about today, uh, we'll be describing where people with IDD live, uh, trends in Medicaid, um, HCBS funding, HCBS stands for Home and Community Based Services. So it's a type of Medicaid funding uh, that most people receive. Uh, so trends in Medicaid HCBS funding for people who are living with families. And then we'll also discuss state variations uh, in those proportions of people living with families and what they may be due to. So uh, the data, most of the data that we'll be talking about today comes from the RISC project and Sherry Larson is the lead of that project. So I'm gonna ask Sherry to talk a little bit about the history of RISC uh, and how the data are collected, what we're looking at here. Thanks, Julie. The RISC project um, has been going on for a very long time, started in 1977 with a census of state-run institutions serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And for its first um, six or seven years, the only thing we had to study was institutional uh, settings because that was the only federally funded type of supports that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were able to receive. In 1981, Medicaid um, changed uh, and added, uh, you might have heard of the Katie Beckett waiver. Um, Katie Beckett was a, a young uh, girl who was living in a hospital whose parents wanted to bring her home, but in order to bring her, they weren't able to bring her home because they had no way to support, get the funding to support um, her needs in at home. And President Reagan, um, heard about that and decided that that wasn't right. And so um, the Home and Community-Based Services waiver was born. And 41 years later, we're talking now about um, how that program has grown and expanded and really how, um, how it has transformed um, the places where people who get services live. The RISC project is a longitudinal study. Um, we've been studying um, services provided by state IDD agencies uh, for more than uh, four decades, and um, we are funded by the Administration on Community Living, uh, the, Intel the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities as a project of national significance. Um, we're one of three projects of national significance. The other two, um, one of them is at University of Kansas, um, and it is um, called State of the States, and it follows the money. It talks about where people are, where the money comes from that people with IDD get for services. And the, the other one is at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and that project tracks employment and day services. Um, and so we're presenting today some findings from our 2018 uh, version of our survey. We have data from uh, 2019, 2020, um, and we're collecting 2020, 21 now, but we are, um, uh, today we're focusing on the 2018 data. 
Thanks, Jerry. And just as a reminder, we'll have some some common audience discussion at the end. But if you have questions about anything that we're talking about sort of throughout, feel free to raise your hand or put your questions in chat. All right. So today what we'll be talking about is basically four key findings for uh, pieces of data um, that will lead to some questions, or at least they led to some questions for me. So first we'll talk about, present each piece of data individually, and then discuss the implications of what, of what, of what that data shows. The first key finding is uh, about where people live. So I'm gonna actually, again, ask Sherry to describe that. What is this, what is presented here? What is shown here, what it means? All right, so there's a lot packed into this little slide. Um, first of all, the slide focuses on showing the places where people who get long-term supports and services through state intellectual and developmental disabilities agencies, where those people live. So 61%, more than half of all people who get long-term supports and services through state IDD agencies live with a family member. So the majority, what's really important to know when you look at this picture is that that's not everybody. There's lots more people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who don't get long-term supports and services through state IDD agencies who also live with their home, in fact, with their family members. In in fact, um, the majority of people of all ages with intellectual and developmental disabilities live with family members. It's really a small for portion of people who live in other kinds of settings. So the other part of this picture talks about where the other people live, where are people who are getting services living if they're not living with their families. And about 7% of those people live in an institution that includes state operated institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But it also in this picture includes people who live in group settings that have seven or more people in them. 10% of people who get services live in a group home um, of one to six people. Um, and 5% live in a host or foster family home and 12% live in their own home. Thanks, Jerry. So, okay. So one question that sort of occurs to me as a follow-up is uh, how are, are these, actually two questions, how are these places different? So these are all, I mean, some of this we know, I think everybody knows what own home means or family home means, or probably you can guess, but some of these other types of settings, how are these places different? And so as a follow up to that, uh, so we understand, are the people who live in these different places also different or do they tend to be the same and it's just the settings that are different? And this is all four of our discussions, whoever wants to chime in in whatever order. All right. Well, let me take a, a quick crack at, at just what are the settings that we're talking about. So family home is, is as you might expect, a residence that is um, where that a person share person with intellectual and developmental disability shares with one or more family members. Um, that's different than an own home setting in that own home settings are settings where the home is owned or rented by a person with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and they're not living with a family member. They might be living with other people with disabilities who are sharing supports, um, but the, those settings um, in the category for own home exclude settings that are owned and operated by provider organizations. Um, the, the host or foster family settings are similar to own home settings and family home settings in that they are residential settings, they're residences, they're homes. Um, in the case of foster families, it's a home owned or rented by the foster family. In the case of host homes, it's a home owned or rented by a peer, a uh, person um, who does not have a disability, who's sharing their home with a person who does have disabilities. Um, in all cases, all of these environments, people um, in uh, who are who we're talking about in this slide are people who are getting services. Um, the difference between group home and institution primarily is on size. Um, we're, we're dividing them by places that have six or fewer people or seven or more people. Um, and um, the there are group homes that have three or fewer people. The distinction as again, is that those homes are owned or operated by a provider organization and they are subject to additional rules under Medicaid policy. So um, one thing I didn't say when I was 
reviewing the slide is there are we ex we think there are about 1.3 million people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the United States who receive uh, long term supports and services. So that's the universe that we're talking about here. So back to you, Julie, and to remind us of the other questions. Uh, the other question is, given that these settings have have differences in terms of how they operated, their size, does that, all, does that also mean that the people who live with them, people with IDD, who live in these different settings are also different? Well, so there are some differences, um, primarily that um, almost all children uh, who have intellectual or developmental disabilities who get services live with their family members. Um, amongst adults, um, there are um, overall, looking at the big picture, um, people who have every um, kind of disability, every level of support need um, are represented in all of these settings. Um, institutions, uh, we are we are down to about 16,000 people now who live in state operated intellectual and developmental disabilities institutions. And there are 18 states who don't have any institutions, which suggests that one of the answers to your question is that 18 states have figured out how to help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, live and get the need, supports that they need in settings other than institution or group home. Um, and so the bottom line answer is um, there are people who, for every person who lives in a family home, there's an analog who lives in one of these other places. For every person who lives in an institution, there's another person who lives in one of these other places. There aren't distinctions in terms of um, overall, you'll find people with all different needs in all of these settings. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Anybody else among our discussants, Neville, Shelley, or Linda, do you want to? Anything to add? Yeah, uh, I would like to add. Yeah, I think one thing which I did not mention when I was introducing myself is that I'm also a DSP, um, a job which is very close to my heart. And I just want to add here from a practical standpoint, my experience in the field, meeting them and these individuals is the fact that one thing which is important to know is that despite the fact that they all fall under this one category of individuals with disability, intellectual disability. They have very unique goals. They're very unique in their needs. And so that's where the difference really lies. And I, I like to stress that difference there that being in a, or having these services doesn't necessarily mean that they are all applied in the same way. Thank you. Thanks, Neville. Uh, Linda or Shelley? You know, I don't have anything to add other than, um, are, are these 18 and older? What was the age group on these, Sherry? I'm sorry. This is people of all age who are receiving services. Okay. So, but the, but the answer to your question or the sub question that you're asking is, most of the people who live in own home, foster homes, group homes or institutions are adults. Yeah, and you know, for me, when I sit and I see these and I think about, so I have a brother who is 40 with a disability and he lives in a shared living environment. And so I'm sitting here thinking, boy, I wonder how they categorize that. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really listening to, you know, I think the definitions have evolved as the home and community-based service settings rule has evolved. And really thinking about, you know, I kind of wrote down here that it's really about who who pays rent or who owns yep. the facility, right? More yep. so than than the structure itself. And so, I think that that's something really um, something to keep in mind when we think about this. I mean, especially as we think about housing being an issue for all people um, with or without disabilities. About how how are people, you know living anywhere um, and affording that and, and sharing, pla renting places and doing those different things. So I, I think the definition over time is really important. And I think about, it's really about who who owns or, or, or pays the rent um, for those environments. And that's what really what we're looking at here. Yeah, that's, that's right on. And um, in terms of people who are in own home settings, I think many shared living settings are going to fall into the own home settings. Um, anytime it's the, the setting is owned or, or rented by the person with a disability, and that person has control over who provides services, they can kick out the service provider if they don't like the person. It's an own home setting. It's a group home setting if they don't like the person, they don't like the services that they're getting, and they have to move to a different place in order to get different services. 
Um, Sherry, I don't know if you see the comment in chat. There's a question. Does level of IDD correlate with a, whether a setting is 24 hour support or intermittent support? Sure. Well, of course, there, everybody um, who has an intellectual and developmental disability is a, is a unique person and has, a, a, has different needs. Um, and um, there are people who, who have different levels of needs who get the intermittent support, but um, uh, people who tend to have more support needs um, are more likely to get 24-hour support. Um, what's really cool about services today is that we are learning new ways of providing 24-hour supports, including the use of technology, which is supporting people who have even severe and, and uh, very intense uh, needs to be able to live in um, settings of their own. Thank you. All right, that this is oh. all right. Another question in chat that is re relevant here. Does this also mean that an individual has legal protections to their living arrangement? Um, that's a really good question, uh, especially as the HCBS rule comes into effect. Yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> the the, home, the Medicaid rule for home and community based services was implemented in 19, in 2014. Um, there is a provision of the rule, the settings provision, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed and is now scheduled to take um, take effect in January. Um, and in that um, part of the rule, it doesn't matter whether you live in a group home or a host home or your own home, if you receive Medicaid home and community based um, services, uh, you're entitled to the to the protections of having a lease um, or another agreement that specifies the conditions of your living there, um, and you're entitled to um, a lot more um, legal rights over your over your over your environment than than prior to this rule going into effect. So yes, the protect the legal protections has re have really changed, um, and. Um, the, the challenge for organizations that have been providing home and community-based setting uh, services in the past is that the translation or the transition from services that used to be provided in a setting where the provider owned and, and controlled everything to <laughs> settings where people with disabilities pro control their own lives and control their own environments um, is a rather massive change and it's a very welcome change. Do the, uh, as far as data sources to measure state advancement towards compliance on, on, on this piece, um, and National Core Indicators, NCI, uh, in-person survey, which is currently, I think in all 50 states, close to 50 states, uh, they have started in collecting data on these exact issues. So is the person's name on the lease? Do they have a key to their home? Things that are in the HTBS rules, so that's there. There is those data um, collected on on a state by state um, basis. So some states are using that to show progress. Uh, and Angela, if you are interested in that, um, we can we can put a link to the NCI data in the chat as well. Yeah, and then Donna, your question um, is: there a place to get more information? There are a lot of places where you can get information about the states that provide services who, uh, that um, in places that are not institutions. The RISC project, the Residential Information Systems Project is one of those states, or one of those places. One of the things that we have on our website is state profiles for all of, all of the 50 states in the District of Columbia in terms of showing where do the people who get services in that state live, um, how are their services funded, um, and some other things. So I would I would point you first to the RISP, risp.umn.edu website. Um, but um, if you are needing more information um, or more details, um, please feel free to contact me through the RISP website. Okay, thank you everyone. We're gonna move on to our second finding. So this this was about where people live, sort of a snapshot, right? Um, the next key finding is uh, about how that has changed over the years. So how's the, how has the proportion of people receiving services who live with family members have changed over the years? 
And Neville, I believe you are going to describe in more detail what is shown here. Can I call on you? All right, thank you, Julie. Um, so we got this chart on the, on, the, on the screen right now. We see a trend from 1998 um, to 2018. And when you look at the light blue color above, those are individuals who are receiving um, the Medicaid waiver. And we see a rise, um, a gradual rise up to 2018. And the, the, the reason for this rise is because in 1998, only about 25% of individuals were receiving um, Medicaid-funded um, uh, services. Now, over the years, the amount of um, uh, services provided by Medicaid or the support by Medicaid increased. And we see this arriving, um, getting to the point of 61% in 2018. So it kind of self explains why um, many more people are getting like this. To go back over if you want to go a little farther and go up Hartford Road, it's up to you. Okay, we're getting some. Can somebody um, who's talking mute their phone, please? All right, so sorry, I thought somebody was talking to me there. So we, we have this increasing, um, and right up to 2018, we have a 61% of uh, Medicaid um, um, funded programs. So it's kind of some kind of um, uh, availability here seeing that the more funding they have, increasing from 25% in 1998 um, to 61% in 2018, explains why we have this trend or this increase. Thanks, Noel. Okay, um, so my question is, my first question is why, and again, this is to all four of our discussants, why this increase? Do we understand what this increase in the, the number of people, the proportion of people who live with family member and getting HCBS services, why it hasn't been increasing over the years? Again, I think uh, before the other discussions chime in here, I think uh, like I already mentioned implicitly is um, the increase is availability, uh, of course, because of the funding, Medicaid coming in to provide this uh, money, to provide the services that they need, many more people got attracted and enrolled. So the more the package, the more lucrative, and the many more people who are going to get attracted and join in. Yeah, um, Neville, I would just add to that. Um, in 1998, we were still fairly early on in um, uh, states figuring out how to best use the home and community-based services waiver. It took a long time for all of the states to implement the waiver program. It started in 1981, but it really, um, it really took a long time. And so, um, for a long time, states were providing supports for families through state dollars, and they eventually figured out that if they used Medicaid instead of state dollars to provide those services, the federal government would pay half of the cost. And so as the states got smarter about um, supporting people who live with family members using the home and community-based waiver, we saw um, a decrease in the percentage of people of the who were served by states using state only dollars and an increase in the percentage of people who lived with family members who got services in their family homes who received home and community-based services. Um, the other big, the other thing to note about this picture and this really important is um, the number of people who receive home and community-based waiver funded supports has, has dramatically increased over the years. And almost all of that increase is accounted for by an increase in the number of people who live with family members who are getting home and community-based services. There are um, there have been some increases in, in people living in own home settings and in people living in host and foster home settings, um, but that they're dwarfed by the number of people who live in family home settings who are getting supports. And so um, as Medicaid home and community-based services have expanded, um, many families have found that their needs are met uh, by without having their son or daughter having to move to another place. I think early on in the risk project, we used to ask the question in terms of waiting lists, we, we would ask how many people are waiting for services? How many people are waiting for home and community-based services? And of the people waiting, how many people are waiting to move from their family home to another place? Early on, moving to another place was the whole was the whole deal about residential services. It was kind of expected that if you were going to get residential services, that you were going to live 
in a setting other than your family home. That is no longer the case. Um, most people prefer to, to live with their families, not everybody. Um, some people prefer to live in their own home. Some people prefer to live with a host or a foster family. Um, but the part of the reason that this program has grown in this way is because it's serving, um, it's providing what people want. Um, and it's providing services to people um, in the um, setting that they're most um, familiar with or, or that they're most comfortable with, sorry. Julie or Linda, anything to add? Mrs. Shelley, um, I would only, I would add that as states are, are, are getting, you know, creative and thinking about their, their um, non-residential waivers. I think that's why we're seeing more and more numbers increase um, in family living at home. And, and with the sort of split between really figuring out, you know, separating services from housing, I think is making a big impact too, because um, people might have the services, but maybe they're not able to afford to move out of their family's home. And so you're seeing, you're seeing that split there as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that the states are getting more creative in terms of being able to self-direct their waivers or create these other types of non-residential waivers that are al allowing people to, to think about different things. And so I think you're seeing the, you know, um, the, the dark blue staying the same, um, and you're really seeing the increase of that living living with the family doubling because I think more people across the entire lifespan, quite frankly, are, are figuring out uh, different ways to, to live in those different models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually kind of notable that the, the number of people, the percentage has gone way down who are state funded, getting state funded supports, but the, but the number of people getting state funded supports has actually stayed relatively stable um, over times. And that's, a, that's an interesting finding. I suspect that what's happening with that is there are people who are not eligible for home and community based waiver services. And, and for those people, um, there isn't an option to get the home and community based services waiver funding. Um, the only option for them is to get services. Um, that are state funded um, because the, the eligibility criteria varies by state, but people with, um, with uh, less, less intensive support needs sometimes just are not eligible to get uh, waiver funded supports. That was actually going to be my next question because I think this graph shows kind of two things. The, 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 the upwards trend is for people living with family who are, re who are on a waiver or so receiving waiver services and that's going up. But then the other sort of story piece of the story is there is the other trend, um, which is the, the darker blue, and that's people who live with family members who receive state funded services, so not HCBS, not waiver services. So um, I was going to ask why has that number remained pretty steady, but you just you just answered it. Um, okay, I want to catch up on the chat a little bit. Um, so how do number how does the number of people living with family and having home community based care funding compare to those receiving comprehensive Zillow services? Anybody want to take a stab? Does anybody know? So is the independent living services. So um, the way I would answer it from the from the risk perspective is. Um, the number of people um, getting, and I'm going to go back to the categories we showed you in the beginning, because those are the categories we track. Um, the, the number of people who receive services in their own home um, uh, has increased about, has doubled in the same time period here um, as the, the number of people living in family homes has more than doubled. And the number of people living in host and foster family um, settings has also about doubled. So there's been an increase, uh, a fairly substantial increase in those settings, but the number of people in those settings is, is very small compared to the number of people in who get services living in family home. Okay. Um, next question in chat, has the risk study assessed domestic violence incidents in any way? I don't believe so, but again, Sherry and Linda. No, um, that's, there's, there's a, that, that's a whole set of questions that's relevant, and that has to do with are people safe where they live? Um, and that is an issue regardless of where you live. It's an issue if you live in an institution or in a group home. It's also an issue if you live with a family member or with a friend. 
um, but we don't in our in our project we don't have a way to track that. Um, uh, it's that would be um, a separate and very important study. Um, Linda, are you familiar familiar with anything that's been published recently on that? I I haven't seen very much um, on that. You'd probably have to check with the um, uh, legal aid um, the um, the arm of the Developmental Disabilities Act that does legal services. Um, I think that they track on what's happening to people in terms of abuse and neglect and probably can give you more information about that. The protection and advocacy um, organizations, and there is one in every state. Thank you. Okay, there are a couple of comments in chat about uh, whether people are actually choosing um, or and families choosing to for people to live in those settings and family um, in family settings. And whether it's because there's a lack of other choices, lack of safe places, uh, issues with the workforce, those are all very valid points. And we will actually discuss some of this at the end during during just our, our general discussion. So hold those thoughts. Um, is there any correlation? This is interesting. This is there any correlation between uh, social socioeconomic status and number of IDD number of people with IDD IDD living with their families. That's a really good question, and it's a question that we need to get much better at answering. Um, we we just had a state of the science conference on um, disparities and um, how do we how do we know if there are disparities based on race or disparities based on socioeconomic status? And the answer is. We don't have good information about that. We have really fairly poor information about that. In fact, um, I was just on a webinar last week with um, uh, the MACPAC, which is the Medicaid, uh, it's Medicaid Medicare um, action panel, and they were talking about um, the issue of the, the poor quality of Medicaid data on race and ethnicity. Um, only about 30 of the states have data on race and ethnicity that's even usable. <laughs> um, and so at the Medicaid level, we don't have good information. Some states have very good information systems um, about that, but we, we, as a whole, we don't. And one of the big challenges we have for adults is that the, the the United States has several public health programs to that survey the, the, the population and ask about their health, people's health status. Unfortunately, they ask about um, intellectual and developmental disabilities for children, but they don't specifically ask everybody if they have an intellectual or developmental disability if they're an adult, which means that we can't use our public health surveys either to figure out what's happening for people um, from different communities. But um, in the conference that we just had, we, there was one study out of California um, that looked at disparities and found that people who were um, black were more likely to live with family members and were and and received how do, how the best way to put it um, re, per person received fewer dollars um, than people who were white. Um, and so we do know that there are some racial disparities, some uh, it, it, based on race, at least in California. And I don't have any reason to believe that that's not true in other places. Um, as far as the risk project being able to gather and, and report on an, uh, that information, we're starting at the very beginning. Um, we will be getting uh, in 20 uh, for the 2022 survey, which we'll be fielding in the next few months, we will add a question about race and ethnicity. So we will be asking state IDD agencies simply how many people do you serve who are in, in various race and ethnic categories, which will give us a start at figuring out um, the the percentage of people who get services versus don't get services in various groups, but it's a long ways from where we would want to be to be able to answer the questions that you're asking here. Um, and, and Julie, if I if I waited I have, I have long a, enough, I, just, I have another comment of that because Mr. Agbo specifically asked about socioeconomic status. Yes, yes. And I think one of the challenges with that with adults is eligibility for Medicaid is predicated on the adult's income and not the family's income. And so we don't really know what the family's income is because the adult has been proven to meet certain um, income limits. And so that individual as an adult may have very little income and could come from a really wealthy family or have their own very little income and come from a family without a lot of extra resources. And we don't know that because that's not 
part of the eligibility question. It's easier to identify that in kids, but um, in adults, it's really a challenge because of the eligibility rules. Right. Well, essentially everybody who has intellectual and developmental disabilities who's eligible for services has uh, is, is in severe poverty um, uh, based on their own income. Um, and frankly, many people who are not getting services are who are adults who have intellectual and developmental disabilities are also in that situation. So Linda's right on, we, we don't really know that. What I was just gonna go to is, there is in the National Core Indicators Survey, which samples people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who get services, there is information about race and ethnicity on, in that survey. Um, it needs to be mined quite a bit more than it has been. There is one paper that came out recently that just started to describe differences, but it didn't differentiate people. It didn't take into account whether the person was living with a family member or in another setting. And we know that there are differences um, by race and ethnicity in terms of where the kind of place where people choose to live. So we've got a long ways to go to be able to answer that question, I think is. One other, what, one other um, data piece that national core indicators collect to have started collecting is uh, basically uh, zip code based uh, neighborhood income. So so it collects zip code and then we by that zip code um, it classifies the, the person's neighborhood into you know income categories. So that's that's one. I don't think they've done anything with those data yet in terms of analysis, but that that is something being collected that's could be an interesting uh, research question, something to look at. Um, um, there are, okay, there are a couple of comments that again uh, are about, uh, uh, are we sort of thinking as we're collecting these data and are working with the data that people are aging uh, and uh, family members who are aging will no longer be able to care for their loved one with disabilities or uh, due to illness or death. Uh, yes, we are, of course, aware of this. Um, and again, this is, we're gonna be discussing the implications of the stuff at the end. So good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Stancliffe just put some resources um, in chat on, on, uh, uh, on, on sorry, <laughs> being a victim of violent crime or where, where you can find some of the data. So thank you, Roger. Okay, anything to add about on this particular piece of data and this key finding from our discussions? Yeah, yeah, Julie, I think um, one other thing which is important to note, which it kind of um, a sip out there with one of those questions, um, is the fact that the, the people in this area where we see the, the, the dark blue color, these are people who are also maybe waiting for services. And this points to the, the shortages that we have right now, uh, because uh, there are not, um, uh, enough services for these individuals, pointing also to the fact that um, we are shutting of uh, shutting in a number of uh, direct support professionals who can assist these individuals, which points back to the burden that the families may be having at this point. However, yeah. there is a, there's an issue of choice here, that family members or individuals have that choice, and some people choose to stay on using what the state is providing because they find satisfaction there. So there's no point why they may want to change to get something else. So they decide to stay in this area because what the state is providing is, is enough for them. And in one of those questions, somebody did ask about issue of security, which points to also the choice that some people have personal experience that they may not want to exploit certain kind of um, services that are available and they choose to stay at home because maybe family members believe that they can provide better services to their loved ones than uh, sending them out of the family into the hands of maybe total strangers, people that they don't trust. So I think all these species are, are put together and it's a, a, lot, a lot more um, broader. However, when I look at it personally, looking at this um, uh, figure, what Julie, um, uh, Sherry already mentioned how the volume of individuals living with family members has increased. The fact that these numbers with the dark blue are fairly constant doesn't necessarily mean that they are the same people. There may be changes there where individuals from this area move up to the light, to the, to the light green color and other persons are joining. In a nutshell, 
it points to the fact that the number of individuals receiving AMA services while living with family members has dramatically increased. Yeah, and you you also alluded, Neville, to one other point, and it's not going to be covered very much in this in this particular webinar. But there are about two hundred thousand people who are waiting for home and community based uh, waiver home and community based uh, funded services um, who are not getting any waiver services right now. And so, what's interesting about that that is that that number has stayed fairly fairly consistent over time. Um, I think. It, the reality is states have been addressing waiting lists. You can see that they've been addressing waiting lists um, over the last 20 years pretty aggressively. The number of people getting services while living with their family members has really grown uh, dramatically, but that's not, that doesn't, um, it hasn't eliminated the waiting list. The, the waiting list continues to be there and it continues to be a challenge. Uh, one more question before, from the chat before we move on to the next uh, key data point. Did you by chance gather any data on those living with uh, with family with a waiver who have family that are paid caregivers? So family members who are getting paid to provide services. Yeah, let me just comment on that and I'll let you, um, Linda and Shelly maybe weigh in too. But um, I just, uh, I was uh, in a meeting with state directors um, and there was um, a comment just simply that the number of states that are that have um, decided to pay family caregivers for to provide services to adults who live with them has has dr dramatically expanded during the um, during COVID. Um, and the question will be uh, whether they will continue those services, uh, will continue to fund uh, to pay family members to provide services or not. I think that the question for children um, is a little different. I don't think there are as many states that are paying caregivers of children. Um, I, I don't have that information, but I can tell you for sure that, that COVID pushed um, uh, states to, to pay family caregivers of adults. Shelly or Linda, do you have anything more to add? You know, the, the paid family caregiver issue is going to be a topic that I think is going to warrant a lot of discussion, um, you know, and and on the surface, um, you know, we're seeing it as as a as a way to to support families um, when there is somebody in their home, a family member in their home. You know, some people see it as a response to the DSP crisis. Um, but I think we're going to have to continue to weigh that the ethics of it, both on terms of it changing the relationship between the family member and, and the person who needs the support. Um, and how do we continue, um, you know, you know, coming from someone who's really working on supporting families policy, we know that providing 24 seven care to anybody, whether you're being paid or not paid, um, comes with some serious repercussions. And, and so how are we, how are we balancing that? Um, I think the additional income um, in a family home is nice, um, but we're starting to run into some real, real issues when, um, you know, it's how, how do you balance um, that the personhood of, of each of the individuals that both the caregiver and the person needing support. So it, this is a tough issue um, that we need to continue to, to really kind of address as we're seeing those numbers go up and them both being a positive for some people, but also can be a negative for others. Yeah, Julie, I think I would recommend that we move through the rest of the content and then turn back to the chat because I think we won't have time to 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 get to the rest of the content if we don't. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Mary Hurley, we see I see your question. We see your question. We'll come back to this discussion for part of what you're talking about at the end, if that's OK. All right, so um, on to we talked about sort of the variation over time, right? The, 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 the number of people, the proportion of people living with family members growing over time. So now let's look at the variation again, snapshot in time, this is 2018, but how that varies in our various states uh, within the US. So this is the next sort of key finding addressing the state to state variation. And Linda, do you wanna yep. describe this? 
Sure. So if you look at this chart, you'll see that the percent of um, long-term supports and services recipients living with a family member varies really widely by state. Um, down at the bottom is Maryland with 1% and all the way up to 88% in Arizona. Um, it's This isn't uh, a judge, uh, uh, any indicator of, of anything other than this is a picture of different service systems across states. So some of the states with um, Fewer people living with their families don't always serve children in their um, state DD systems. Children may receive Medicaid funded long term supports and services and other agencies within the state. Uh, children also get services through school and things like that. So it may be that some of the states that are closer, that have fewer people in the family home, it's just an artifact of where people are getting served within within the state um, systems that provide Medicaid services. Um, other states, for example, if you look um, probably towards the bottom there, maybe the bottom 10, you'll see Minnesota. And I'm gonna pick on Minnesota because I know Minnesota system um, is fairly low because early on when we first got the waiver of Minnesota, we invested heavily in small um, group homes. Um, Minnesota opened up, up hundreds of uh, congregate settings for four people. Um, and, and so our state still shows fairly low in terms of the number of people living with their family, even though that number has grown dramatically in Minnesota, that people getting long-term supports and services in their family home, that legacy of the original old system is still there um, in terms of what our state looks like. Um, Arizona, for example, serves a lot of people across the age spectrum in their family home, and that's why they sort of pop up at the top. They're a, they're a state that... Um, um, provides a lower level of support to lots and lots of people. And that's the other thing with Minnesota is we're a sort of a heavy investment in services state and maybe, although we've eliminated our waiting list, but for a long time served fewer people with more money. So that is what this uh, chart is showing us. Yeah, and there's some other issues here because this is, um, uh, well, this shows uh, primarily home and community-based services uh, funded supports um, and a, a few states now um, in the in, especially in the west coast um, are using other funding sources to support um, uh, people uh, including state plan home and community-based services and we're not caught up in terms of of um, that funding source and how where people live who get that funding source um, but Arizona, just as another comment about Arizona, they serve a lot of kids um, in their state IDD system. Uh, several other states don't serve kids at all in their IDD system. And they're Maryland served. would be an example of that. Yeah. So yeah. Th those in, in those states, it's not that they're not, it's not that there aren't kids living in their family home getting services. It's just that they're not served within the IDD system. Um, and the system starts with um, when people are either 18 or 22. Okay, so my first question um, is sort of the broad question, but uh, why, I think you touched, Linda, you touched, based on, touched on this a little bit, but why is there so much state variation? And also, has that always been the case? I would say, yes, it's always been all the our case. Discussions. Yeah, I mean, it's always been the case. We have, you know, 50, 51 different service systems, if you include DC. Um, and every state has set up their systems completely differently in how they they are able to interpret and use um, the rules from CMS in terms of Medicaid funding. So it's just the way it is. Um, what was your first question? <laughs> uh, well, just just more talk more about why why there's so much state state variation. Some of the some of the driving factors that we know of. Uh, well, some, some of it has to, again, go in terms of what this is only um, state DD agency funding. So these are only people served under the umbrella of their state DD agency. And so there are people, particularly children, who are getting services in their family home and some other agency that risk doesn't count, for example, would be one reason for the difference. State policies. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Sherry. You know, I, I, I would, I, I'll build on what you were just going to say. State policies do differ. Some states um, uh, use their um, uh, the the resources that they have at at hand um, with a priority to support people in their family homes, and other states are, have that as a lower priority. And some states 
A few, a few states still serve people primarily in institutional settings. Minnesota's not in the, Minnesota has a lot of group homes, congregate settings that have four people in them, but there are still some states that have a lot of people living in larger um, congregate settings. What I would like to say about this graph is this graph is repeated over and over again in the risk report. You could pick any one dimension uh, on which the risk data collects and you'll, you'll basically get the same picture. And when, when you start to look across all of these different things, whether it's the amount of money per person that, that people get, whether it's the, um, the number of people served per 100,000, whether it's um, the number of people in institutions, whether it, the states vary. And, and I, I guess my biggest caution about this picture is that please do not draw conclusions about good and bad solely based on this particular picture, because um, there are other factors that are really important that, dis that distinguish between states um, that aren't reflected here. Primar one of the biggest of those is how many pe people per 100,000 receive services. And the second one is how much money each person gets. And, and unless you take those two things into consideration, this picture is meaningless. And so um, I, I caution people for, about using risk for data for that reason. I, I would caution you in terms of report cards that other organizations put together also, because if you only look at one dimension or if you wait certain dimensions and you don't take into account other factors, you will misunderstand um, the amount of resource that states are investing into um, supporting people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Shelly and Neville, anything you'd like to add to this piece? Yeah, I think, I mean, this, I think the slide is a difficult slide. I, I think that, um, you know, just because the numbers do vary. And I, I do think, I think something you said earlier is probably the biggest reasons is, is understanding if this is 18 and older, um, you know, like really understanding the age groups. Because if, if a state agency really isn't serving a lot of people, a lot of children, um, then it, it's possible their number is, is lower, right? Um, and so I, I do, I, th I think this, you have to be very careful with this slide. Yeah, and there we do, if you're really interested in that piece of information, we are able to dis, to differentiate between children and adults that are living with family homes. It's just not in this particular presentation or on this particular slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move on. And this is sort of the last uh, key finding that was in the in, in the uh, research brief itself, but before we actually talk about this, um, there's a good question on, in chat that is a, can be a lead in to, to this issue because now we're gonna switch and actually talk about family caregivers and their needs. Um, so there's a, there was a question in chat a little while ago um, and I just lost it. Do any states do a caregiver need assessment? in addition to the person with IDD getting a needs ass assessment. And uh, the comment is that UK does that. Linda, Shelley, I think this might be something that um, you mean. I, shall, I, I can go for Shelley and you can probably add more information. Again, some states do, um, and some states, it's, I can't tell you how many, and some states it's voluntary. So there may be something that's available for the people who are doing the assessments to do, but it doesn't happen. For example, Minnesota is one of those states, but I would say it's not a consistent practice across all states. Now, Shelley, um, what your thoughts are about that? Yeah, I would say it's not, it's more often than not happening. You're, you're yeah. really hearing the, the family caregiver assessments really being pushed from the aging yeah. side of the conversation. So as states are really trying to understand, you know, a lot of individuals can be dual eligible, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so you're hearing some conversations there, but there's really not, I mean, I, I can't off the top of my head, think of a state that is, is really good at the family caregiver assessment side. And I think there's also a lot of, um, that's another area where um, families don't want to be assessed. So you're going to assess well, how well they care for their loved one. There's a lot of a lot of concern um, about this. And so um, with the intention of family caregivers being assessed so that their needs can be met is really good. Um, but I think the other the other side of this is a lot of states are, are really 
grappling with what they can fund if they do find something out on a caregiver assessment, since, um, you know, the pri primary recipient of HTBS service is the individual. And so I think you're seeing states try to figure out different policies and different service delivery, and they haven't figured that out completely yet. So if a need is identified, um, you know, how, how can they fund supports for the caregiver if the individual's over the over the 18? So I, I think this is right and it's very messy right now. And I think a lot of people are are, are needing to have conversations about this. Um, I don't, there's not a really good one to pinpoint though, unfortunately. <clears throat> So Linda now has an opportunity to talk about what we do know about family caregivers from some of the research that she's done. Yep. So the information on the next two slides come from, comes from a survey we did in 2017, which we are just about to redo um, in partnership with the ARC, and it's called the Family and Individual Need for Disability Support Survey, or the FINES. Um, and one of the key points I want to make regarding this when we um, is that when we compare people, uh, family, uh, it was mostly family, mostly parents actually, who provided support to their family member with an individual with a dis developmental disability across the age span. Um, and we compared them to uh, caregivers who participated in the ARP, the, uh, the Association for the Advancements of Retired People, I think it is. Uh, they have a national caregiver study. Um, and we compared the two groups of caregivers and the FINES participants. Um, were were providing providing supports to a family member with IDD. Um, they were more likely to live with a family member. Um, of in the fines, ninety three percent of the people who responded to that survey were living with their family member. Um, it's much less than that in the the ARP study. Um, and but they also reported that they were more likely to provide more kinds of supports. And um, more intense, uh, more intense level of supports for longer periods of time than the people who participated in the AARP study. The AARP study wasn't only people who um, were providing supports for an aging relative; it included people who were providing supports to people with physical disabilities and other kinds of disabilities too. Um, but it was uh, wasn't um, specific to IDD like ours was. But I think this is really important to consider when we're thinking about family members. For providing support to somebody with IDD, particularly if they're living with a person, because it has some um, implications across the lifespan for both the individual receiving support. And Shelly touched on that a little bit about whether or not the person actually wants to uh, continue to live with their family as they become adults and, and changing roles and, and uh, you know, becoming an adult and having more autonomy and things like that. But also um, for, for the person who's providing supports, particularly in terms of um, sort of financial consequences of providing supports over the over your lifespan to somebody and, and um, in terms of lost wages and ability to save for retirement and payments into social security and things like that. Um, and so this, this slide is, if you look at the blue, those are people who responded to the fine survey. And the green are people who responded to the caregiving in the US survey. And so, um, and uh, pretty much all cases, um, caregivers who are providing support to a, a family member with um, an intellectual developmental disability uh, reported um, some, some more uh, ramifications related to work and, um, and, and income. So giving up employment, um, reducing hours. Um, we're, we added a question because it came up when we were presenting this information um, with a really great audience question about, well, what about people who are pur purposely underemployed in order to be able to provide supports? So we added that to this next, next year's question. So I think that's really um, in terms of thinking head into policy and what we can encourage policymakers to do, this is a really important um, area to consider in terms of paid leave and um, what, what, what's valued. Um, in terms of the, the support that people are providing to their family members. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, okay, so my question then, especially seeing sort of these, these horrific numbers, <laughs> um, are there uh, tools and resources that are available for families, family caregivers? Is there anything um, that people are working on in terms of you know trying to reduce these numbers? Um, and make uh, make 
the lives of family caregivers simpler, easier, um, so they don't have to give all of this up just just to provide care for their uh, provide supports for their for their family member. And I'm gonna see if Shelley wants to address some of this because I know a lot of her work is about exactly that. You know, um, one of the things that I think is also important as we look at the slide, and, and yeah, we're talking about this from an HCBS pers perspective, um, a lot of this also comes and stems from the school systems. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the, um, the conversations we're having with family and family caregivers is, you know, even pre-COVID, um, that, that the services and supports during the school day aren't, aren't happening, that they're having to leave a lot and there's a lot of different issues. And then um, the, the, the compound effect of COVID and, and virtual um, has, has really called it, caused initial problems. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have the added related to any types of behavioral supports and people aren't wanting to provide behavioral supports. And so, you know, moms and dads and family members are being called quickly to have to go, go respond to that. So, um, you know, again, it, this varies across states. I think you're seeing states really trying to utilize their um, their HCBS waivers to, you know, to utilize personal assistant hours to, um, you know, be there to reduce some of these things. You're seeing um, you're seeing states try to figure out. Um, respite supports in addition to personal assistant hours um, for some of those things as well. The reality is, is that most of the funding and the priorities and policies related to family caregiving for people with family disabilities have been focused on 18 and younger. Um, and so that, that, you know, I think we have a real window of opportunity right now because there is such a, a big push towards family caregiving um, as we see aging ba baby boomers. So how are we really um, advocating at our state and federal level be because this is happening um, and, and trying to help them understand what are the different supports that need to be in place? You know, we're also having conversations with employers. You're seeing a lot of employers um, think about the, the caregiving issues, um, especially as we start looking at, you know, diversity and equity conversations. There's a lot of conversations around that, um, around all types of caregivers. Um, so, so there's a, a number of places um, that, that continue to address this, but again, there's not any one really great solution, but you're seeing lots of policies um, trying to respond to this issue. One of the things that strikes me as I as I look at these numbers, and it, it's on the previous slide. There's, can you show the previous slide just for a second? There's the two things at the bottom of this slide that we haven't really talked about. We've talked on the on the on the next slide. Really, it talks about all the work impact, the impacts on of of caregiving on people's ability to work. But I think the other thing that's really <laughs> really profound is the impact of caregiving on on the stress of family members and on their health. Um, we've had some recent uh, work uh, study come out about the, the impact of, of COVID on the direct support workforce, and, and it's, it's very similar to what we're seeing here, where people just, the, the levels of stress, the levels of depression and anxiety um, and other health issues are, are very much affected by caregiving, and as caregivers are stressed because there aren't enough direct support workers to go around. And when there aren't enough direct support workers to go around, the ones that are available are first assigned to group homes where there's a group of people who would be neglected if this person didn't show up as opposed to just one person who has a family member there. And of course, because they have a family member there, they're somehow less worthy of getting um, support, or at least it seems. So I, I guess uh, I would call attention to the severe impacts that caregiving has. And as we're looking at policy, um, we're looking at potentially ongoing and, and increasing um, crisis amongst family caregivers. And, and I, Shelley, I think you're right on in terms of the the, the caregiver, the, the families of kids who who's, for whom school has become very, very unpredictable. Um, they're talking about those issues in a way that we haven't been able to get attention to for adults in a long time. All right. Um, 
Okay, we have about 20 minutes left, so uh, we'll talk about policy recommendations first. Our brief, the policy research brief, ends with making some policy recommendations based on the data and based on what we know about the issue. Um, I'm going to ask Sherry to go through them just quickly so we can move on to the discussion questions, the audience discussion questions. Sherry, you're on mute. I actually hope that Linda can can go through these because really she and Neva worked on these um, pretty hard. Um, okay, sure. Um, well, I think the you know I think there was comments earlier in the chat. Sort of fundamentally, the direct support workforce crisis is affecting the supports people get where wherever they live, um, if they live in their with their families or if they live with. Um, and some uh, other place outside of their family home. And it's it's not, it's, so it's affecting families along with um, everybody else that there's just not enough people to do the work. <laughs> and so, um, and if we, what I would encourage people to live in, in um, and support people to live in the places where they wanna live, with whom they wanna live, that we need to have the workforce to do it. And so to address those challenges and take some of the, um, and I'll just, uh, pref you know, the, I'll finish this and I'll say what I was gonna say, sorry. Um, uh, is that there needs to be a, a livable wage for people who provide direct supports. Um, and that's fundamentally what, what's needed to solve the workforce crisis. But I will give two examples of um, people that I personally know who have their um, adult, and this touches on some of the comments in chat too, their adult family members who are living with them. Um, my one friend hasn't had a direct support, uh, any any relief, any direct support relief for three years. Um, and so, um, and she is also concerned about, um, she's in her late 60s, her son's about 40. Um, what's going to happen? He's an only child and her husband died young and their family's all in Thailand. Um, and so what's going to happen when she can't um, be the support person anymore? And there are effort, her efforts to create a support system and get him get set of services in place that he'll be comfortable with before she can no longer provide supports. Have um, none of them have worked because of the support direct support workforce crisis. So that fundamentally the support the workforce crisis has to be solved. Um, I think for a lot of other of the issues to be solved is the fundamental problem. Um, the the um, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly affected families. I don't know that there's been a lot of research in that area, but from kids staying home to school to people um, who were going to work in, uh, work in other work employment and day programs that closed down and all of a sudden family members who may have been going into their own jobs during that time when that family member was out for the day, um, all of a sudden had to fill the gaps there. The pandemic also again exacerbated the the workforce crisis, and so um, we can't do anything. Evaluating that won't fix fix what happened two years ago, but I think we need to understand it, and so that we can have better plans for the future because there will be another pandemic. Because there will always be another pandemic. Um, <clears throat> that there's not great supports, and Shelley's mentioned this, um, and and she can talk more about this too. Is that we don't really have supports for family other than respite, um, that there needs to be supports for families who are providing support and whatever whatever that looks like. Um, and it's difficult because Medicaid funding is tied to the individual who's eligible. And so we need to think of creative ways to make sure that people are getting support they need um, to stay um, healthy and not have their futures financially negatively impacted. Um, and then also the, the waiting list problem continues to be a big issue, particularly in some states. There's states where people have been on the waiting list for 20 years or more, and uh, the people continue to live with their family members. And the, that needs to be, you know, that it's an area that needs to be addressed, um, that those waiting lists are, are, ad are addressed. And, um, and then the increased funding to make sure that people, once they leave school, have something meaningful to do during their day. So um, their lives are, or their quality of lives are improved, but it also then supports the um, 
ability of the people who are providing support to them, their family members or whatever, to um, have some time to earn their own money or take care of their own health care needs or whatever else. So those are the policy recommendations. <clears throat> yeah, I want to go back to Linda to what you started with, with, which was the story of the family member who hasn't had services for three years. My understanding of that story is that that family member has an allocation. They have money that the state has allocated for them to use for services and haven't been able to use right. that for services exactly. because they haven't been able to find a person to, work. to provide yeah. the service. So, and, and, and I wanted to follow up my comment about that, about your story to say, um, one of the things that we should, that we need to watch is uh, what's happening with utilization of state money that's been allocated to services that hasn't been spent. My understanding is that there, there is a very large amount of money that's been allocated. It, that's, it's much larger now um, under in, in the COVID era than ever before in terms of how much money was allocated to people to get services, but they couldn't deliver the services because there weren't people to deliver the services. I think we're gonna need to be watching that particular issue very carefully now, um, because it's an indicator of how severe the stress on the system is. All right, so it is time to bring the rest of our audience in. And I'm gonna pose just this very basic, simple question to everyone, um, starting with our discussions, but everybody else on, on, um, who's, who's listening in. Please chime in. Um, obviously, this is not going to be a yes or no question. Um, is the growth of people living with family, people with IDD, or living with family and receiving long-term services and supports, is that a good thing? And obviously, again, like I said, it's not going to be a yes or no question, but um, when you, if you want to talk about this, uh, give some of your reasoning for why it is or is not a good thing or yes, there is a qualifier here. Um, anybody wants to start? Anybody in the audience, just raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak up. Um, I can chime in there on this one. I think um, if, we, we, if we, I think this is a very good thing. And if we miss this point, then every other thing we are saying here doesn't really make sense. I think the focus here is the individual, whether good, or bad policies, whatever thing you say, if the person, if the individual is not the focus of that discussion to better their lives, then it's useless. So I think the growth of the individual, if you look at the last point of recom the last recommendation, is about getting these folks integrated into the community where they too can find meaning. Even when we are talking about what all kinds of policies and also helping family caregivers at the end of the day, it's helping these individuals with intellectual disability. When we, if we miss this focus, then any other thing we are doing around is meaningless. So yes, the, my answer here is yes. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Mary Hurley, one of our, uh, one of the folks on our attending um mary do you wanna do you wanna say more about what you are the issue that you were trying to raise uh yes what they're trying to raise um for the fact is that obviously it's a good thing that there are not large institutions as in the past but for a certain group of people who are autistic and have challenging behaviors and or mental illness um they need uh, more care that can be provided in the home. Here in New Jersey, there are no community services for someone who has an, uh, um, a, uh, a challenging behavior that presents in harm to themselves or to another individual except to call the ER. Why I posted the Washington Post article is that was one of the best articles I read about what the family was faced with when they did call the ER. Uh, a doctor at NYU in uh, New York told me one time, never call, um, uh, put um, Sean in a situation like that because they won't know um, how to, uh, to, uh, to, that's right, uh, to, to help 
the individual and they will cause traumatic stress to the individual, which will, uh, we're not talking about trauma here at all. Uh, what percentage of developmentally disabled people suffer from trauma that is not addressed? So I think while it's good that we're talking about all these different things, we're neglecting a population that it has no services in the community because their needs are so high. So to talk about the family home as being um, adequate with no supports in the community, it doesn't make any sense. It's wishful thinking. Okay, sorry to go on. I feel very strongly about this, as you can see. <laughs> Terry, do you wanna? Well, I, I, I think that the comment that you just made is an indicative of, of the needs of family caregivers. Family caregivers have a variety of needs and a very a variety of, of, of opinions about what needs to happen and have had a variety of experiences and those are valid experiences and valid needs. We need to listen to what families are saying and figure it out. Uh, this particular caller happens to be from a state that is a very heavy user of institutional services and doesn't have uh, as much uh, in terms of community-based supports as some other states do. And so um, the absence of those community-based supports is a reality for, for a lot of families in that state. It is also a reality for people in other states. And uh, there is definitely a need to address Can I interject the for a moment when you're saying that parents are you know, saying what they need and so forth. I'm not just talking about parents. I'm talking about the professional literature, doctors and, you know, psychiatrists and so forth have much to say on this issue. Why are you all in, at this university not reading the literature and reaching out to medical uh, people and, uh, you know, tapping into the neurobiology research that's out there? Uh, parents only know so much and, and they're very good at knowing about their loved one. But it's not just parents saying this, and it's not because New Jersey has a lot of large institutions. If they didn't have an institution uh, here, there are some individuals that I don't know what would happen to them um, that, that they're sending them to. So there, you can't just throw everyone out and then uh, say everyone goes home and not um, provide what's need. If you have a developmental disability and a mental health issue, that can't all be taken care of at home. I think your views are, your it's too narrow. You need to broaden what is happening in the communities. And it's not just New Jersey. It's happening in a, a lot of states. Mm -hmm. um, Thank I'm, you, I'm Mary. Okay. Thank you, Mary. No, it's, it's a really, it's a really valid point and issue. And I, I will just say one thing. Um, what we're talking about today is kind of, you know, it's limited in focus and scope. There's a reason for that because these are very large issues and um, we can talk about this for weeks. Um, it, there, we are, the university and some teams at the university are looking at those issues too. So we are, we, we, we are aware. I don't, I don't want you to think that this is, you know, we're not paying attention and we're not incorporating what you are telling us and what we have, we're learning um well, in, well could you could work. you re, could you all read the washington post article at least i would certainly be i'm i i already have a uh, bookmark so i'm certainly okay. planning on it thank you okay thank you very much i don't want to uh, you know i've taken up enough of your time i appreciate it thank you very okay. much we we appreciate julie, your comments really julie, uh, neville and then judy julie could you could you please explain what you mean by growth here because probably maybe my understanding is different from the growth of number of people that we oh, okay. were showing over the years. Okay, so growth of number increase. of people. Yeah. Okay, I answered my answer was pointing to growth in the individuals. Um, yeah, so I think I think what I said I was talking more about the growth of the people. That's like their personal growth, and that's why I pointed to the last um, uh, recommendation about integration and stuff. Uh, but I think if I understand the question, if I take it the way Julie actually presents it to mean growth of the number of people. Then I will say uh, maybe there is really I will not say a yes or a no. It's a matter of choice. Yeah, um, I think there I'm going to change my answer to say it's a matter of choice wherever the individual finds satisfaction. So it, that answer actually would really make sense if the individual says, you know, I'm living with the family and this is not what I want. Then there is a problem. Or I'm living with a family member and this is actually what I wanted. Then it's it's cool. I'm gonna read one comment in chat, which is 
sums up the discussion about this question fairly well. It's also they're also it's also in a in a form of question, so um, we can answer that if we can. Um, what is known about why family choose families choose home based care? Is it denial? Is it confidence that no one can love their kid like they can, or is it lack of good out of home options? Do we know why? So this is a question to all of our discussants. Do we know, is there research on why and the whys? Well, I would say that there is, and there are a lot of different reasons that families have for making the choices that they make. Um, I think in the last couple of policy forums, it's been very clear that some families don't feel like they have choices. They don't have enough choices. They don't have a there's not something available that they that's needed in their communities. But I, I would be very interested, Shelley, in your thoughts about this question. <clears throat> you know, th this is a, I mean, this is a tough question, right? Because um, some of the families that we talk to don't, they don't, they're, they're fearful of government services in their home or out of their home. Um, some of the families we talk to um, because of their sort of culture and upbringing don't understand why their child would move out of their home. Um, but then other families that we're talking to um, whose children are growing up um, in schools, being educated alongside their peers are wondering why they don't get to move out like their peers do and, and their siblings do. And so, you know, one of the things that that I think isn't hasn't really come up in this discussion for me is, is again, as we separate funding of services from living expenses and, and rent and, and owning all the homes and stuff, the converse, I mean, that's really where the conversation is. It's not about, do I live at home with my family or do I live in a group home? It's, you know, how are we helping people take their services where they want to live, whether that's in their family home or it's down their street in an apartment or a house that they own. And I think that we're not, we're not addressing that. Um, and so as we, again, start looking at, at different living situations, and we're looking at trends of people without disabilities moving back in home into their family homes. So, I mean, I think we can't, we have to, um, th this question is a really a difficult question. And the reality is, is that people really have never moved out of their family homes. Um, you know, people, families have always been the backbone of our long-term service system. And, and we, we really, um, we really, we can't deny that fact. I think it's 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 really important that it shouldn't be an all or nothing thing for families, and it often is, right? And and I think that so oftentimes you're not eligible unless you're in, unless you're in crisis enough. And I, I think that we have to, you know, that starts going with, um, you know, some of the the waitlist conversations, but it's also some of it about our eligibility conversations. Um, and so all of a sudden, a family's backed into a corner because the caregivers die, or because the the um, behavioral support needs are so intense that they can't um, keep them at home any longer. So. Um, you know, I it, I don't think there's growth of people living in family homes. I think people with disabilities have always lived in their family homes. Um, and I think that we're starting to figure out how can we support them differently and better is, is what I hope that we're having the conversation about. Yeah, Shelly, you're right on. I, I, I think people have always, with intellectual and developmental disabilities, have always, the majority of them have always lived with family members all throughout their lives. The question that, that we're really talking about is, how much governmental support are we putting to families to help them when they're doing that? And, and so the good news side of our conversation today is that there has been a growth in the number of family, people living with family members who get supports funded through the home and community-based waiver or through the, um, through the governmental systems. The, the challenging side is it's not enough. There's plenty of people who don't have their needs met. There's plenty of people who would like to live in their own home or to live in another place and they can't find affordable, accessible housing. Um, there's plenty of people who need services and there's no pr appropriate services in their communities and they're ending up in the emergency room or, or jails or other inappropriate settings. And we've got to continue to, to focus on how to meet those needs. But the focus today is kind of what what is the service delivery system doing and where are the challenges and the challenges are immense.
All right. Um, we had one more discussion question, but we're not going to try to tackle it in a minute. Instead, I'm going to leave that for all of you to sort of, and for all of us, um, to think about. And the, the question is, what are, if this growth in the in the number of people living with family member receiving services continues? which, you know, given the workforce shortages, the GSP shortages, all of the things that we know about, if the trend continues, what are the implications? What are the implications for the system? What are the implications for our work? What are implications for our communities? Um, not gonna try to talk this out right now, but we'll leave it, we'll leave, this discussion was the sort of food for thought for you, uh, for all of us. If you have questions or if you want to share your thoughts, send us emails. Uh, this is, these are all our emails on the screen. Feel free to reach any of us, reach out any of us. Um, the slides and the, the slides, the recording uh, will be posted on this link that you see on the slide here. Uh, you will find the brief itself at a different link also see on your screen here. We will also send all of these slides uh, to everyone who registered for the forum afterwards. So um, I'm going to thank our discussion, ask for any last thoughts or goodbyes from them, and we'll close after that. Julie, so, can I jump in really quick? I just put a in the link. Um, there's an open comment period right now um, for national strategies to support family caregivers coming from ACL. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful, um, wonderful recommendations, but I'm not sure that they hit the mark on families of individuals with developmental disabilities. So if you're on this call, I highly recommend that you review those um, caregiver, that caregiver um, reports and, and really think about the things that you put in the chat and the questions that you're raising and the issues that you're raising. And I think that ACL really needs to hear that. Um, and so there, there is a, a small window of opportunity in the month of November for that. Um, and I really do think they need to hear from the IDD community um, about our issues related, related to this. And I just want to thank everybody for your attention and for your engagement. Um, it's been a great um, opportunity. I know some people submitted some questions that we weren't able to get to. We will review those questions and uh, try to respond offline. Um, so thank you for your participation. We look forward to uh, seeing you at our next um, at our next policy forum. To be scheduled soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sherry, Shelley, Linda, and Neville, and thank you to everyone who attended. Have a good rest of your Tuesday.